think there are a number of sports teams here today. Welcome. I'm not the usual pastor. He's much more profound and better than I am. So uh, whatever I do this morning, he's much better. So you'll want to come back and enjoy uh, Pastor Steve's preaching. Um, when we were looking at the different, we're in a series on the prophets. Uh, you're just joining, now joining in progress, a series on the prophets. Um, and so there have been a number of sermons on various prophets. And when I was asked to preach this morning, you know, I said, okay, what's, which, which prophet isn't mentioned here? And I was surprised to find that Micah wasn't, wasn't mentioned here because Micah has like the verse that everybody memorizes from the prophets. I mean, hopefully we've memorized a lot of verses from the prophets, but there's one verse that it seems like a lot of people know, and that's Micah 6, 8, which was just read. He's shown you what the Lord requires of you to love, uh, to, to do justice, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. And so I want to look at some of that, especially the word justice there. I don't know whether you uh, have watched much of Harry Potter. Um, my family, I have several children, and they kind of were the same age as uh, Harry Potter growing up. And so it's like every year, you know, and, I, and um, my children are weird. They actually read the books. Um, I mean, they read. I mean, do, do people read? This is the 21st century. But anyway, um, they would say, oh, here's what's really going on. Okay, I'll, I'll wait for the movie. But um, one, one of the movies is... Um, uh, Harry's getting a little older. I think he's 16, if I remember correctly. And um, the bad guys go after him when he's not at school. And they're not allowed to use their wands when they're not at school. Uh, but, you know, the bad guys, in fact, really bad guys. And so he uses his wand. And immediately he gets a magical note telling him he's been dismissed from school for using his wand outside of, of school. And you're not allowed to do that, apparently. I, I mean, do you guys use your wands outside of school? Um, I don't know. I don't think Iwu has a, a rule like that. But anyway, it's not important right now. Um, he gets in trouble, and his uncle, Vernon, who's really not a particularly nice guy, his response is justice. You know, as if finally this bad Harry Potter guy is going to get what he has coming to him, and he's going to be kicked out of school. Of course, we, um, if you you know, kind of watch the movies, you know that actually Harry's a pretty nice guy and Vernon's not a pretty nice uncle. And so it's, Vernon's understanding of justice is a little, you know, twisted. This is, of course, the kind of our human situation is. We define words based upon what's in our head. And, you know, we, where do we get these definitions in our head? Well, we grow up with them. We, we don't, it's not that your parents sit down and they say, okay, here's what justice means. Although, I don't know, maybe, maybe you had that discussion sometime. But you kind of hear things, and as you hear things, you kind of keep adding stuff to your dictionary. And the thing is, we don't know what we don't know, right? Um, and the book of Micah, one of the prophets, this was written in the 700s B.C., that was a long time ago. Let's stop and calculate. No, we won't, we won't do the math. But anyway, that was a long time ago, like 2,700 years ago. There, I did it. So 2,700 years ago, the prophet Micah used a word. It wasn't even English. didn't exist, right? It was Hebrew. It was mishpat. Uh, it was, uh, you know, say that 10 times. Use it in a sentence this, this week with your friends. Mishpat, justice. Um, the translation that was read this morning was to do right. But what does it mean? Well, we're going to automatically put our definition into that word, right? We're going to take whatever it is the way that we understand justice, and when we read that, we're going to assume um, that it means what we might not even ask the question. We're just going to assume that it means whatever we think justice means. This is one of the benefits of uh, studying the Bible on a slightly deeper level. If you have a, uh, some electives, you might take a course called uh, Inductive Bible Study where you, you learn some tools about how to observe, how to do something called a word study where you kind of find where a particular word is used all the time in the Bible and you kind of go through them and you kind of say, oh, this has a slightly different uh, uh, meaning than I thought. I think one of the, one of the main things the church uh, what the world needs is to get into the Bible. That, that's first, right? Let's read the Bible. But a second thing that we might do is that we might begin to explore what these words actually mean by kind of going through and, and observing them. And so I want to talk a little bit this morning about some uh, interesting, they were interesting to me, things that popped out to me as I was preparing for this sermon this morning, as I was looking at this verse, Micah 6, 8, this famous verse about doing justice, loving mercy, and walking humbly with our God. I think the first thing that jumped out at me is the word do. Do justice. 
Now, I'm, I'm an introvert. I would be fine living in a cave as long as there's wireless, as long as I can, you know, get on the internet. I don't, you know, I don't mind what's going on around me. In fact, my wife, who's not an introvert, drags me out of the house on a regular occasion. She came home this week one night and she said, we're going out to dinner Friday night with, with such and such. And I'm like, I didn't tell her this, you know, do we really have to? I mean, I, 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 I want to see what's going on on Facebook, you know? Uh, and so uh, I dutifully went out, you know, went out to dinner. We had a wonderful time. I'm always glad that I, you know, meet other people. There are people outside of myself. It's hard to believe, but I, there are other people. And so I enjoyed it. And then, then they said, let's go, let's go to, for dessert. Let's go to des dessert in Huntington. And I'm like, What's in Huntington? I, I don't even know where Huntington is, but I, I dutifully went and, you know, it was a, it was a fine, fine dessert. So I'm, I'm an introvert. I'm fine with uh, sitting by myself. Well, the, the problem is, is that you don't really do justice by sitting at home. You do justice by actually getting out and doing something. And I don't know whether it was the Lord or, or whether it was planned. I assume it was the Lord that we have the, these uh, tables out in the lobby about signing up to, um, to be a, a th do things like be a mentor uh, for a child at, at Francis Locum. I have, I have some friends. I have a friend named David Vardaman who for years and years and years has been a mentor of a young man. He's, he's not a child anymore. He's pretty big. Um, but they've stayed in touch all this time. And I know that that young man has, his life has been changed by the fact that uh, David Vardaman meets with him. And, and, and he's going to be, a, I believe, by God's grace, a, a much better person uh, because of this stepping in. And when I read Do Justice, to be honest, that's the kind of thing that I think Micah, in, it's in the venue of what Micah had, had in mind, uh, this actual doing of justice. Now, it's singular in this verse. It says, he has shown you, I know we read people, but the word is Adam. It means a person. Um, he has shown you you. He has shown you person. He has shown you man, woman. He has shown you what the Lord requires of you. Now, most of the time, we err on the side of thinking it's all about me in Scripture. We tend to be, in, our culture tends to be individualist. You know, it's all about me, number one. Um, but most of the time in Scripture, it's plural. Most of the time, it's y'all do this. Um, the, there's an emphasis in Scripture on us together doing things that I think a lot of times we miss. Part of it's English. English has Y-O-U. Are we talking about one Y-O-U? Are we talking about a lot of Y-O-Us? You know, it's in, in English, you can't tell anymore. You used to be able to. That was one advantage of the old King James Version, as you could tell when it was singular, when it was plural. But anyway, most of the U's uh, most of the uses in Scripture are plural. But this is a place where it's a singular. He has told you, O Adam, O person, what the, Lord, that the, uh, what the Lord requires of you. And so this is something we all as individuals need to do. It's not just for the leaders. It's not just for the heads of Israel. It was for the heads of Israel. Micah has a lot to say about the heads and priests of Israel, as we'll see. Um, uh, Micah had some very indicting words to say about the leaders of Israel. But it's not just for the really important people. It's also he has showed you, individual, what the Lord requires of you, and the Lord is asking you to do justice. I think College Wesleyan, one of the great things about College Wesleyan is that this church is really good at, at doing justice. People like Vicki and, and Bo and others are really focused on doing justice in the way that I understand Micah and the prophets to primarily focus on when they talk about uh, doing justice. I remember the, the, the park that we helped open just a few weeks ago. We had the, the, um, the playground that I think it's now found a permanent resting place, but it used to be a traveling uh, playground that, that, that wandered around for, for individuals who maybe didn't have a playground in, in their neighborhood. And of course, the, the mentoring at Francis Slocum and things like that. This is a church that is really good at doing justice as I understand the focus of a Micah to be. And I, wanna, I want to celebrate College Wesleyan for being a biblical church uh, in that sense. So the first thing that I've noticed as I was preparing to this morning is that Micah talks about doing justice. Justice is not just something you blog about, but it's something that, that we actually do. The second thing I noticed 
uh, as I looked at Micah this, this time, is a kind of, there are two sides to the coin of justice in, in the prophets. The one side we get really good. Our dictionary is really good at the one side of justice. And the one side of justice is the smack the bad guy sense of justice. We get that. We get the sense that if somebody has done wrong, they need to be, be punished. And that's certainly in the prophets. If you read the book of Micah through, and it's not too long, you might read Micah through this week. Um, you know, do a chapter a day until you're done. Um, th there's more than some chapters. But anyway, uh, the, book of, the book of Micah talks about uh, smacking the bad guys, the bad guys of Israel. They're doing bad stuff. The, the leaders of Israel are doing things like they're taking people's land, taking people's houses. It's like, wait, this is my house. I don't care. I've got the power. I'm taking your house. I'm taking your land. That kind of thing's going on. Then the people who control the scales. So, you know, I got on a scale yesterday. I hope it's honest because my weight is down. So I'm happy about that. You know, my, I have just scales in my house, I think. But Israel didn't have just scales because at the time they would kind of like I'm going to put a rock on here so that, you know, you pay me more. All right, there's a rock on that scale. No, there isn't. Yeah, there's a rock on... No, they had unjust scales. They were taking advantage of people uh, by kind of fiddling with the, the system to make them have to do more. I wonder, I've wondered if they were doing this in Jesus' day. You know, why, why does Jesus get so upset at the money changers in the temple? Maybe because they're taking advantage of those who are having to, to buy a goat. I mean, if you're coming from Rome, you're not going to bring a goat on the ship. That would be a horrible thing. You know, a lot of responsibility, you know, watching a goat over, over land and sea. But so when you get to Jerusalem, you get your goat for the sacrifice, right? And you have to pay money. And it's kind of like buying gas on the turnpike. It costs more because it's a captive audience, right? And so... Uh, they were taking advantage, I suspect, of the people. And this really ticked Jesus off um, in, in the Gospels, in the final Passion Week of his, of his life. And so there was bad stuff going on in Israel. And, and uh, Micah is upset about it. And part of justice is smacking the bad guys. And, and Micah does say that God is going to smack those, those bad guys. So that's definitely a part of justice. There are some other parts of justice too. I wonder if we might tweak our thinking even here from smacking. Uh, maybe you don't think a lot about it, smacking. Maybe I have a therapeutic problem and I need to get some counseling. But maybe, maybe, maybe stop thinking about punishment and thinking more about stopping the wrong that they're doing. Um, not so much about punishing the bad guy, but stopping the oppression that the bad guys are doing, stopping them from taking people's lands and houses, stopping people from using unjust scales and things like that. That's a, just a small little tweak in the way we think about it, uh, justice. But instead of the Vernon Dudley, or whatever his last name is, justice, and it's not really justice, but it's really you're wanting vengeance on, on somebody, to let's stop the bad things that are happening uh, to people. But that's one side of the coin. The one side of the coin has to do with the oppressor. What, what really came home to me this time around in Micah is that the other side of the coin is helping the people who are oppressed. That's also part of justice. So justice in, in, in Micah is not just stopping the bad that's happening, but it's about helping restore those to whom the bad things have happened. I remember several several years ago, uh, I was on a group that was working on the curriculum for what is what is now Wesley Seminary, and we were working on the course on uh, congregational relationships, which involved a little bit of pastoral counseling. And I remember a conversation we had about how the church is really good at helping the abuser be redeemed. Um, that is, if somebody has been abusing somebody, we are full of forgiveness and we're good at helping restore them. But it was said, I distinctly remember in that conversation that sometimes, without thinking, the church makes too light of the person who has been abused. That, that you can have a, a, a situation where you're really trying to help the person who's been abused forgive the person who's abused and not paying as much attention to the person who actually needs to be healed, uh, not taking as seriously the situation of the person who has actually been the victim. What I'm, what I'm getting at is, is that it's the exact opposite focus in the prophets 
and in the Gospels. Jesus and the prophets were focused about restoring those who had been oppressed more than they were about even smacking the oppressor. Again, the oppressor will get smacked. Don't, don't worry about it. They're, they're going to get it. But, but the prophets and Jesus especially focus on restoring those who've been knocked off the road, getting them back on the road, getting them out of the ditch, getting them back into the mainstream. And I want to read to you from Zechariah, uh, chapter 7, uh, a, a passage that is very typical of what the prophets say over and over again. Judge with true justice and mercy and compassion. Let each do this to his brother and sister. And do not oppress the widow or the orphan or the alien and the poor. You find in the Old Testament this list mentioned over and over again. Uh, and these are individuals who are knocked off track in society. And in ancient Israel, they didn't have uh, Social Security, they didn't have Medicaid, they didn't have Medicare, they didn't have social services. There was nothing really other than the goodness of people's hearts to help those who found themselves on, on the outskirts of society or on the edges of society. If you are a woman and you lose your husband and you don't have family, you can't go get a job somewhere. There's, in ancient Israel, there's nothing for you to do. If you are fatherless, there's not an automatic Child Protective Service, there's, no, there's nothing that's going to take care of you in ancient Israel. If you have lost everything that you own, there's, there's very little path uh, for you to find your way back uh, into the mainstream. And of course, it's always easy to pick on the stranger. It's always easy to pick on the person who isn't from around, around here. And so we find over and over again in the prophets, we find it both in Zechariah, but we also find it in Amos very significantly. We find it in Micah. We find it in Isaiah. We find it all over the Old Testament that God is concerned with these people that it's easy for the rest of us to ignore because it's not my problem. They're not my problem. I'm doing okay. They're not. I feel bad for them, but you know, be good, be healthy, be fed. Um, and this is a group that the Gospels are and, and the prophets are very concerned about. And if we do a word study on the word mishpat in the Old Testament, we will find repeatedly that even more than the oppressor, these are the ones that, that uh, the prophets are concerned with, lifting them from where they're at into the mainstream, back into society. In fact, even some of the the, the strong words of the prophets against serving other gods have a people element in it because part of worshiping other gods in ancient Israel was pr some pretty bad stuff. So for example, you may have noticed in the scripture this morning that it mentioned offering your child as a sacrifice and you're like, yeah, nobody would ever do that, right? <laughs> Offer as a sacrifice. In fact, some of my children watched this morning's first service and they were a little concerned that I talked so much about child sacrifice. My wife had to assure my children that none of them were in danger. But this was actually something that they did in the ancient world. They actually sacrificed their children to show their devotion to another God. Now, Yahweh, Yahweh doesn't need child sacrifice. Thank you, Lord, that there's no child sacrifice. It really, some things click for me when I think about that the reality of child sacrifice in, in this ancient world. Uh, you may know the story of God asking uh, Abraham to sacrifice his son Isaac. Anybody know that story? It's in Genesis 22. And you're like, why in the world would God ask Abraham to sacrifice his own son? That doesn't sound like God. And, you know, and of course, God does ex expect obedience from us. But it just clicked for me once that you, you have to read this. This is what... Uh, Daniel tells us at 1800 BC, 2000 BC, uh, when, when Abraham's living, child sacrifice is part of the normal world back then. And it just flipped for me to think this story might be more about Abra God teaching Abraham that he doesn't have to sacrifice his son than it is Abraham just randomly testing God. Because Abraham may have thought, oh yeah, I knew this day was coming. I thought God might ask, ask me to sacrifice my son. And the, that the lesson is actually guess what? I don't need you to sacrifice your son. What I'm getting at is worshiping other gods was not a good thing. Other gods had temple prostitution. There are all kinds of things that were involved with serving other gods, violence. And so serving Yahweh was nothing like that. And so even when the Lord gets upset about them serving other gods, it's not 
entirely because he's jealous, although he is jealous of, he is jealous of our worship, the Bible says. But it was also because serving these other gods involved stuff that hurt people. And God doesn't like it when we hurt people. Think of some of the synonyms or, or, or associated words with doing justice uh, in uh, the Old Testament. I don't know about you, but if we were to go to downtown Marion and say, hi, I'm here in downtown Marion, and we want to find out what people think justice is like, and you ask some people in downtown Marion what justice is like, they're probably not going to say, well, justice is like having compassion, and justice is like showing mercy. And yet these are the words that the Old Testament prophets regularly associate with doing justice. And it's, one, it's when we see this kind of thing that we realize the definition of justice in my head probably isn't exactly the same. I mean, maybe there's an overlap, but maybe, just maybe, the definition of justice that I have in my head isn't exactly what the prophets were talking about entirely. And then I dig into the prophets so that I can actually hear what the prophets were actually saying. In this Micah 6, 8, uh, he showed you what the Lord requires of you to do justice, to love mercy. I love the, the, wor the Hebrew word there is kesed. We don't have an English word that fits the bill. We just can't, I, there's no English word that, that exhausts the meaning of this beautiful word. Uh, some, sometimes the Old Testament translates it as loving kindness. Sometimes it translates it as mercy. Um, some have suggested it's his God's faithfulness to his covenant. It's such a rich term, and it's overwhelmingly positive. Jonah, uh, in Jonah 4.2, Jonah said, when, when God forgives Nineveh, Jonah's like, I knew you'd do this. You're full of kessid. You're full of this gracious mercy and blah, blah, blah. Jonah's very upset. Um, that the Lord would, would but, but this is the Lord's justice. And the Lord's justice is, brings people back from, from where they've gone off track. And of course, Jesus, if anything that I'm saying sounds familiar, this is the way Jesus ministered as well. Um, if you look in Luke chapter four, we have what I like to call, and I didn't come up with this, um, Jesus' inaugural address. Jesus is in his hometown of Nazareth, He's about to begin his ministry uh, to uh, Israel. Um, and he picks up the scroll of Isaiah 61 and he opens it up and he reads where it says, uh, the Lord has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor, liberty to the captives, sight to the blind, and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And when you, when you go through the gospels and you see what Jesus does, he clearly says that he was focusing on the lost sheep of Israel, the lost coin, um, the, the lost uh, person in the parable of the prodigal son. This was the focus of Jesus' earthly ministry. He says, the healthy don't need a physician. It's the people who are sick that need a physician. And those are the ones that Jesus, more than anyone else when he was on earth, focused on. So I want to end this morning with, with kind of, I've been talking about justice from the standpoint of those of us who have an opportunity to do justice. But you may feel like you're on the other side of the equation. You may feel like you're somebody who's been knocked off track in some way. Maybe, maybe it wasn't even a person that did it. Maybe you're just finding yourself, you're in a situation where you don't feel like you're, on, you're in the mainstream. You feel like you're on the sidelines. You feel like you've been knocked off track. You feel like you're, you know, you've, you've come out of COVID with your finances is in complete chaos. Uh, for, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I've driven around Marion and I've wondered how, how are people making it in this particular kind of uh, financial situation that the, that the, uh, the world seems to be in. Um, at, but you may feel like you're knocked off track. You may feel like you're on the edges. And I love the way Jesus uh, finishes the quote from Isaiah 61. Because after he said that he's come to proclaim good news to the poor, liberty to the captives, sight to the blinds, he says, and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And that is the news for those of you who feel like you're out of off track. Those of you who feel like you're on the edges. You may feel like you're on the edges spiritually. You may feel like you're not where you're supposed to be spiritually. God wants you to get back onto the main track. God wants to pull you off from the sidelines and get you in the game. And so this is the year of the Lord's favor. And it's always the year of the Lord's favor. It may not always feel like it's the year of the Lord's favor, but it's always the year of the Lord's favor. You know, the Gospel of Luke 
was written at a particular time and place, I personally think it was written after the, te after the temple was destroyed, after Jerusalem was destroyed. And, and you think, well, what, what audacity Luke has to say that this is the year of the Lord's favor when we know good and well that the temple is destroyed and Jerusalem is destroyed uh, and, and things aren't looking good. And when Jerusalem was destroyed, they took the elite of the city, they carried them captive to Rome. And then the Romans had this little ritual they did where they lead these captives all through the city and at the end of the parade, they kill them. <laughs> that doesn't sound like the year of the Lord's favor. And I can hear Luke's audience saying, why are you telling us that this is the year of the Lord's favor? It sure doesn't feel like this is the year of the Lord's favor. Sure feels like Israel is in a really bad place. Now, Jerusalem is in ruins. The temple is in ruins. But it's always the year of the Lord's favor. This is the truth of the Beatitudes. Blessed are those who mourn. No, they're not. <laughs> I don't know. Do you feel blessed last time you had a real good crying spell? I'm not sure. Maybe you did. But it is always the year of the Lord favor, Lord's favor. Sometimes we feel that favor, and it seems like the circumstances around us are such that we feel that favor. Other times it doesn't you know, feel like it's the year of the Lord's favor, but it's always the year of the Lord's favor. It is always, this is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. So I want to bring you that good news from the Lord today that today is the, the year of the Lord's favor with you. And even if you don't feel it today, you will feel it, especially when the Lord comes and sets everything right and we experience justice in its fullest sense.